Dear friends, this is our Earth and this is an asteroid, a celestial body. We observe the celestial body from far away and eventually we recognize that it is going to hit the Earth. Our study is to see what is happening in between the two celestial bodies, how the orbit of the body is changing because of the gravity of the Earth and what is happening close by. And uh, for doing that, we need to use uh, some uh, tools, some formulas. We cannot demonstrate all of them, but I leave you in the comments a link to another YouTube channel where all those uh, formulas are well demonstrated. And um, for the time, I wish you to enjoy yourself. Let's start together. The video is split into parts, also two presentations. In the first one, there will be discussed three studies. How to find the body orbit, starting from its observation, where the body orbit is crossing the Earth, and what is the travel till entering to the Earth atmosphere. In the second part, we will see what is happening within the atmosphere, which are the possible trajectory changes that may occur unpredictable, and uh, how an impact to the Earth is looking like. Let's start from the observation. On a defined date, the 10th of July 2021, a celestial body is discovered at a certain position and having a defined velocity. Position and velocity are both vectors, also three components each, altogether six coordinates. Moreover, we need to refer those coordinates in a heliocentric reference because the Earth is also moving. We adopt the heliocentric Aries elliptic system, which is so defined. The origin in the Sun, the X axis oriented to the first point of Aries, that is the vector Sun Earth at the vernal equinox, Z is normal to the ecliptic plane and oriented to north and y is given by the right hand rule. Here are represented the six mentioned coordinates called also state vectors in this table right up. And for each of them, we calculate also the modulus. For practical reason, in this presentation, the decimal separator is the comma and the digit grouping is the point. Our task is to find the orbital parameters as well six, which define the trajectory of the body, actually its position at any following time. The body orbit is an ellipse. We assume it is a body orbiting around the Sun. Otherwise, it could be also a parabola or hyperbola. To define a body on an, an ellipse laying on a defined plane, we need three parameters. A, the measure semi-axis, E, the eccentricity, and Ni or F, the true anomaly, which is the angle from the periapsis. But since we are in 3D, we need to introduce three additional parameters, inclination i, the capital omega, right ascension of the ascending node, and the small omega, the argument of the periapsis. To determine the orbital parameters, we need to introduce three new vectors, h, the angular momentum, defined as the cross product between the vector r, the position, and the vector v, the velocity, then the vector n, defining the line of nodes, which is k cross h, where k is a versor of the zeta axis, and e is so defined. It's 1 over mi, the gravity constant, the cross product between velocity and angular momentum, minus the R versor. Its modulus is the eccentricity and it is directed from the origin to the periapsis. We calculate those vectors by means of R and V, which are known, and we get the values in the table right up. For me, we need to use the one of the Sun because the body is orbiting around the Sun. Moreover, we calculate the mechanical energy, that is the sum of the kinetic and the potential one. And this is a scalar value. V and R are the modulus of the given state vectors already calculated at slide number three. 
The semi-axis A is the negative mi divided by two times the mechanical energy. The negative sign is because the mechanical energy is negative. The eccentricity is simply the modulus of the vector E already calculated in the previous slide. The inclination I is the arc cosine of the scalar product among the versors H and K. The capital omega is the arc cosine between the scalar product of versors N and I. I is the versor of the axis X. And here, because of the cosine ambiguity, we take the positive sign if the scalar product among N and J, J is the versor of axis Y, is positive and vice versa. The small omega is the arc cosine of the scalar product among the versors N and E. The sign is concordant with the one of the scalar product between E and K. K is the versor of axis Z. Finally, the true anomaly F is the arc cosine of the scalar product between R and V, the state vectors. Positive if R and V are forming an acute angle, negative else. Important info is that the first five orbital parameters are fixed. They are not changing with the time. Only the true anomaly changes. And this defines the position of the body within the orbit. Once we found the orbit of the body, we need to consider the position of the Earth. Question. Where is the Earth on the date of the observation, that is the 10th of July 2021? Actually, the orbit parameters of the Earth are well known. The semi-axis A is, for definition, 1 UA, that is 149,600,000 kilometers. The eccentricity is also known, being 0 0.0167, and the inclination I is 0 for definition, since the Earth is laying on the ecliptic plane. Capital omega is also 0, and small omega is 100 3,32 degrees. All the above parameters are fixed. The only one which is changing is the true anomaly F, depending upon the time. At the given date, F is negative 175,32 degrees. Here we have represented the two orbits and the position of the two celestial bodies. In blue is the Earth and in black the asteroid. We notice that the orbit of the asteroid is not on same plane, but inclined of about 4 degrees. Therefore, half is above the ecliptic and half is below. That is the reason for the dashed line. The vernal axis is in red and the units are given in UA, astronomical units. We are searching now if and when the two bodies have a crossing point. Actually, the orbits are crossing, but this is not enough. We need the bodies to cross, and for doing that, we need a calculation tool. However, as a first approximation, we may use a graphical trick. We let the bodies run within the orbit along a complete period of time, and then we observe. Let's start. We see that the bodies which are distant on the observation date are getting closer and closer, and they are crossing when as well their orbits are, and it is about the 25th of June 2022. Now, as anticipated, we need a more sophisticated tool to assess exactly when the minimum distance is occurring and which is that distance. We focus our study in the interval between 25th and 27th of June 2022nd, where the encounter may occur. And for any time of the interval, we get the state vectors of the two bodies, also R and V. And from them, we calculate the relative position as a vector. And uh, we search for the minimum of that position. Our task is to get the state vectors back from the orbital parameters at a different time. We explain it in three steps. First, we find the true anomaly at a different time frame. Then we get the perifocal coordinates, the ones on the orbital plane. Finally, we get the coordinates in the heliocentric reference back, 
by using rotation metrics. We need to find the true anomaly at the new time, the 25th of June 2022, which is the day 8212. Reference is the 1st January 2000. And the true anomaly at the observation time has been already found at slide 6, 126.01 degrees. We calculate now the eccentric anomaly E of the existing F first, which gives us 2.063 radians, and uh, the corresponding mean anomaly is given by the Kepler equation. So M is 1.923 radians. The new mean anomaly, M1, is given by the old one plus the mean motion times delta time. The mean motion, N, is defined as square root of mi over A to third. And we find 7.227 radians. The new eccentric anomaly, E1, is found by solving the Kepler equation iteratively we get E1, 1.085 radians. From this new value, we get F1 back using the arc tangent formula. And finally, we find 70.56 degrees. The perifocal coordinates of both position and velocity are dependent upon the fixed orbital parameters and the variables f and r. f we have already found. To get r, we use the polar equation of the elliptic trajectory. We notice that since the coordinates are only two-dimensional, the third component of each vector is zero. Now we are facing the hard part. How to transfer the perifocal coordinates back into the heliocentric ones. We need three rotations, one along zeta axis, about small omega, one along x, about inclination i, and once again, another one along zeta axis, about capital omega instead. Combining the three rotations together and substituting the corresponding values, we get the matrix in blue. This we need to use for transforming both position and velocity perifocal vectors. The results are displayed in red and green respectively. Here they are the perifocal coordinates of R and velocity. In blue, it's the matrix we have calculated above, the rotation matrix, and the results are here for the position and for the velocity in the corresponding units. Repeating the same procedure for the Earth, we get the new F1 on the 25th of June 2022. And then the perifocal coordinates, R and V, and back the heliocentric state vectors using the rotation matrix. We observe that the rotation matrix is different from the one used by the small body, even though it's always the same for both the position and the velocity. And we notice that the third coordinate is always zero because the Earth motion is in the ecliptic plane. We need to check the distance between the two bodies and look for the minimum. We can proceed iteratively, starting from the day 8212 and going step by step. Each step is 30 minutes. We observe that we have actually a minimum at the day 8215,71 being the minimum something about 16,000 kilometers which is very close to the Earth, but farther than the radius of the Earth, which is 6,400 more or less. So we'd say the body is not hitting us. We are safe. Everybody is happy. Unfortunately, this approach is not correct. Here, we assume the small body is maintaining its orbit regardless with the distance from the Earth. But in reality, the orbit get changed because of the Earth gravity, being the effect of this one prevalent with respect to the Sun as soon as the body enters its sphere of influence. Soon after, 
the orbit is not any more elliptic with center on the Sun, but hyperbolic with center on the Earth. The boundary is at the sphere of influence, and therefore we need to stop the search of the encounter not at the minimum distance, but at the distance among the bodies equal to S or E, sphere of influence, that is 925,000 kilometers. We find this condition at the day 8213,5. Soon after, we calculate the state vectors with respect to the Earth, that is the difference among the ones of the body and the ones of the Earth. And from the state vectors, we use similar procedure as seen before to get the orbital parameters. And this time we recognize that uh, A is negative and E is greater than 1. The trajectory is a hyperbola. Here we have an animation of the body orbit inside the sphere of influence of the Earth. The displayed motion is quicker far from the Earth and slower close by. In reality is the opposite. Uh, this, however, allows better to follow the trajectory. The first analysis we have to perform is if the body is entering the atmosphere or not. Let's look for the perigee of the orbit by using this formula, A times 1 minus E. We find 6,002 kilometers, which is actually less than the radius of the Earth plus the atmosphere, altogether 6,478 kilometers. Then we can find all the relevant parameters of the hyperbolic path, like the deviation angle phi infinite, 95,90 degrees. Then we can uh, calculate the V infinite, the V at infinite distance from the Earth, so at the boundary of the sphere of influence, already calculated as a modulus of state vectors and the velocity while entering the atmosphere, 12,087 kilometers per second. Moreover, we can calculate the flight path angle, the angle among the vector's velocity and the tangent to the atmosphere. In this representation, uh, of course, the radius of the atmosphere and the sphere of influence are not in scale, but this is for representation purpose. And we find as a flight path angle 16.9 degrees. The last calculation we have to do is the travel time, and we we'll use the hyperbolic anomaly F for that. Let's call F2 its value at the sphere of influence boundary, which is achieved when R is 933,000 kilometers, the closest approximation to 925,000. By using the formula displayed, we get F2 4.401. With the same formula, when R is equal to the atmosphere radius, we find F3 0.202. And now we introduce both F values in the expression of the time to the periapsis. And by difference, we get the time between position 2 and 3 that is about 50.5 hours. So this is the travel between position 2 and position 3 up to the atmosphere. That's all for the first part of the presentation. We have learned how to assess the trajectory of a celestial body, starting from the observation. We have learned how the trajectory is changing because of the gravity of the Earth, and we have seen what is happening close by. Now, in the second part, we will see more details inside of the atmosphere, which is not any longer a pure orbital mechanics problem because of the friction of, with the atmosphere and also because of the rotation of the Earth. I hope you have enjoyed it and see you next time.